Right. So I've definitely come to understand, particularly in the last two years, that there's a, a massive lack of understanding of how we got the constitutional arrangement that we have today. Like, why does our civil government work the way it does? Why do certain, why are certain systems in place? Why is the judiciary independent from parliament? Why does parliament have its two houses, the House of Commons and the Senate? How is it supposed to keep the government in check or does it, or does the government actually dictate how, uh, you know, is it the prime minister that should dictate the types of laws we have in this country or should it be uh, parliament as a whole that does that and so on? And how did that all, of, all develop? And in the last two years, I've seen such unprecedented uh, restrictions on on freedom and and liberty that uh, I wondered if is there some sort of amnesia <laughs> going on around uh, our constitutional history and and so I'm a lawyer. I I went through law school uh, over a decade ago, and actually our constitutional history is not taught in law school. Uh, in fact, it's not taught in any of the law schools in Canada, with the exception of one. And there, it's only an optional course if you want to take it. So, so if I take in, in my law school, my constitutional history goes back to 1867 when Canada became a country. And so there's, there's one course that I have to take that, that studies that aspect of our constitution, but there's no study that goes back beyond that. How, like no talk about Magna Carta from, from 1215 AD, like over 800 years ago, no talk about the glorious revolution of 1688, no talk about the enduring struggle over 600 years between the church, between the gentry or the, the barons and the king. Um, no talk about the struggle for human rights, for fundamental freedoms to be enshrined in a law above the king. Uh, all of that was, was missing from my legal career or my legal education. And so I, I started digging into that myself over the last two years, done, done quite extensive reading on both from a historical perspective and also a legal historical perspective. And I've developed a, a presentation that um, I thought might be a little boring sounding with its title, but it's, <laughs> it's called um, Our Constitutional Heritage in the West. And what I try to do is to explain to a lay audience, so people who are non-lawyers, in a way that's engaging um, how we got to where we are today so that we can understand and appreciate just what went into the long, 800 plus year struggle for uh, a constitutional democracy that we have today. Uh, and also what's at stake if we're not aware of what all went into it and, and what can so easily be lost. And, and I think what we are losing over the last two years. Um, yeah, and so I give that presentation, uh, I have given it to multiple churches um, across uh, the country <clears throat> and, and to other, other groups and, and it's been well received. Um, so, so yeah, and, and I think, you know, some of the issues that, that you've been talking about on the podcast, you know, touch on this as well. Uh, too many of us, including lawyers and judges uh, and politicians, but also just regular uh, average citizens in this country just don't know that history. And if we don't know our history, we're bound to repeat it in, in terrible ways. And, and so my hope is that if, if more citizens can be awakened to, uh, yeah, the, the, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the, the, uh, the pain, and the suffering and the loss that has been sacrificed for the, the system of law and the system of government that we have today, then perhaps if we understand that, we, we would be more eager to defend it to, against, against certain erosions and, and, and attacks. Mm. Yeah. Would you, I, I'm curious. Um, so when I was in school, I, I, again, doing accounting, but I had this, I was really into economics and I took a course called History of Economic Thought. Mm. But the prof was talking about how, you know, very much like the teachers or the professors that were currently teaching this course, when they're gone, no one's going to continue teaching this. And I was just wondering, you know, is there a parallel there where let's call it history of legal thought used mm -hmm. to be something that was taught mm -hmm. and it's, you know, disappeared? Um, I'm wondering if you've sort of covered that or learned about that as well in mm -hmm. your digging yeah. So <clears throat> there's one Canadian legal historian, his name is Ryan Elford, and he wrote a book is published last year called Seven Absolute Rights. And it's an excellent, excellent book. He's, he's an excellent historian. And he makes that point that, in fact, up until the 1950s, in order to be uh, in order to receive your law license, in order to complete your legal education, you didn't just have to do one mandatory course on your constitutional history. You had to do three mandatory courses. That's what, that was the absolute minimum. And that was at a time before the charter was in place. I mean, now the mandatory constitutional course that you have to take in law school basically is, is, is dominated by the charter. So back then you're reading 
uh, you know, you're reading Blackstone's Institutes, you were reading uh, about Edward Koch and the struggle between the judiciary and the king, you were reading about Magna Carta, uh, you're reading about history and, and all, everything that went into the constitutional arrangement of 1867 when Canada became a country. All of that was mandatory uh, lessons back then until the 1950s when there was a sudden uh, and very deliberate shift away from the idea of constitutional law um, as being a law distinct from the whim or the will of the, gov uh, of the governing people, of, of the government, uh, towards what's called legal positivism, which is basically saying that, you know, the rule of law is basically being uh, governed by due process. And as long as, as long as the laws are passed in, in a proper way, then whatever the law says, the law says, and, and there's no, um, yeah, there's no deeper grappling with these more foundational constitutional pr principles like freedom of religion or freedom of speech or um, inherent human rights apart from, you know, the, the will of the people as reflected in, in, in the laws of the government. Please subscribe and hit the bell to stay up to date. If you liked or disliked the snippet, give it a like and share your two cents with us in the comment section. And remember, Sixth Sense makes change.